Hi, I'm Justin Calories uh, from the Smithsonian. I'm going to be talking today about uh, an approach to characterizing movement behavior based on continuous space, continuous time, stochastic processes. And then I'm going to apply that approach to a data set on Mongolian gazelles. Um, in the next talk, my postdoc Chris Fleming, sitting right there, is going to kind of pick up that characterization of the movement and then relate it to environmental factors. So the talks, those two talks are connected. OK, so I'm going to motivate this in a similar way to how Paul Blackwell motivated uh, his talk yesterday, if you saw that on uh, continuous space, continuous time models. I'm going to start by talking briefly about the classical movement modeling approach in ecology uh, based on discrete step random walks. So the idea is your critter traces some continuous path through the environment. You happen to sample the path at discrete points in time. Um, and then you discretize the path by sort of connecting the dots and working out the step lengths and turn angles that, uh, uh, that result. And you model that as a, as a discrete step random walk or correlated random walk model. In that framework, the step length uh, and turn angle distributions and things like the mean squared displacement are the key quantities of interest on which you base your inferences about movement. Um, those are Markov chain models, so you have only dependence on the previous location or previous step in the process. Um, and more recently, that kind of basic modeling framework has been extended to include multiple behaviors by saying each distinct behavior has its own uh, random walk model associated with it and trying to estimate uh, the sequence of those things from the data in one shot, so-called composite correlated random walk model. OK, so Paul talked a lot about uh, somehow my slide is cut off. can't see the title. Is there any way we can like zoom out a little bit on the projector? OK, I'm going to keep going. Um, so Paul talked a, a lot about the sampling rate dependence of these kind of discrete step models. So if you sample this way or if you sample that way, same underlying path. Um, and you calculate things like a diffusion rate or a step length and turn angle distributions, you get essentially different answers. So here, if you want to say, you want to summarize the movement rate of your critter uh, in a standardized way, you might calculate the diffusion coefficient. And you can see that the same underlying path, the answer you get is going to depend very heavily on the sampling rate, the way that you sampled the process. That's obviously not very ideal behavior. Step length and turn angle distributions behave similarly in that they are very, very heavily determined by how you sample the data. Uh, in effect, you are mixing the observation process with the underlying movement process in a way that renders your inferences very sensitive to how you observe the data. And you only get good answers out of this approach if the relevant time scale or time scales of the movement process happen to be similar to your sampling rate. Usually you don't know that a priori. Okay. A uh, second problem with this approach that Paul didn't talk about is the inability to incorporate autocorrelations. Okay, so when you have auto you so real movement data, unless you sample super, super coarsely, are almost always invariably going to have autocorrelations in them, sometimes operating on different time scales or over different distances. You have strong autocorrelations, persistent autocorrelations in your movement path. Your, the, your movement is essentially non-Markovian. You can no longer get away with this one-step dependence. Instead, your next movement step or your next move depends on the entire history of where you've been before, weighted possibly by how strongly correlated uh, it is with that. Okay, so, and if you're looking for different movement behaviors in a path, um, sometimes they're, they're more apparent at certain time lags than others. Okay, so if you sample one way, it might reveal one particular behavior. If you sample another, it might reveal something different. Um, now, this Markovian correlated random walk uh, framework is essentially blind to this kind of multiple movement behaviors. When you have these time lagged relationships, these persistent autocorrelations in the data, correlated random walks just can't see that. So when you discretize your path, you're going to end up with some kind of step length distribution. Um, if all that you have in the data are these time-lagged relationships, you're always going to get a nice unimodal step-length distribution no matter what. You just can't see that those diff different things are in there. Okay, so the only way around these two problems 
is to switch to a method that separates sampling from the underlying movement process on the one hand and that allows you to incorporate autocorrelations by using all possible time lags in your data, not just the time lag you happen to sample at on the other hand. So that's our basic approach. We're borrowing essentially movement models from physics and statistical techniques from geostatistics and kind of fusing the two uh, uh, and adapting them for movement ecology. So we view movement as a continuous stochastic process. Your individual was always somewhere, whether you observed it or not, um, that happens to be observed at discrete times. That sounds like a subtle shift, but it's absolutely fundamental. Okay, it's a fundamental change in the way that you look at movement data. And it gets rid of some of these problems that the classic correlated random walk framework has. Okay, on the statistical side, you then focus on the fundamental statistics of that stochastic process. So the mean and some representation of the autocorrelation structure in the path. Now, if you have something like a migratory species, you have a mean position that's going to change in time as it goes back and forth. Um, for the example I'll talk about later, the Mongolian gazelles, they don't do that. They're nomadic. And so I'm going to not talk about the mean anymore. So identifying the model reduces to finding a model that matches the autocorrelation structure of the data. Um, you can characterize that by the autocorrelation function or the semivariance function. They're kind of opposite sides of the same coin. I'm going to focus on semivariance here because it has better estimators relative to the autocorrelation function. But they're, they reveal similar information. OK. The next step is to express these movement models, continuous space, continuous time, stochastic process models, in terms of their semivariance functions. OK, so a different model implies a different semivariance function. You can then calculate the empirical semi, you can estimate the empirical semivariance function using uh, variogram techniques from geostatistics and then use semivariance as a sort of interface between the model for which you have a theoretical semivariance function and the data for which you calculate this empirical variogram. Okay, so semivariance sounds big and scary, but it's actually very similar to mean squared displacement. Um, you're just calculating the squared distance uh, between uh, uh, that the individual traveled between two points in time and averaging that over um, all pairs of points in the data that share the same time lag. So if you represent your data like this, like a time series, this is supposed to say time one, time two, time three. Um, and just for convenience, I'm gonna copy that. If you calculate the squared distance traveled between times one and two, times two and three, three and four, and so on throughout the data set and average those, that's your semivariance at, time, at one time lag. You can do the same thing skipping. So you go from one to three, two to four, so on and so forth through the data set and average those. Keep doing that, three time lags apart, so on and so forth, until you end up with the first and the last observation in your time series, as far out as you can go in lag. Notice that you're losing pairs of observations as you go out in lag to the extreme that at the end you just have one. Okay, so we're going to consider four movement models here in this analysis, um, starting with the simplest, uh, Brownian motion, which, whose semivariance function is just a straight line. It's just uh, linear in lag, and the steepness is governed by the diffusion rate, V. Anomalous diffusion generalizes that to um, either super or subdiffusion, depending on the value of the scaling exponent. More realistic is the uh, ornstein uhlenbeck process that Paul talked about yesterday. This is like Brownian motion with a central tendency, kind of mean reverting tendency, so a home range-like behavior. This has a variance parameter associated with the size of the area the individual ranges over, and a time scale parameter related to how fast it gets back and forth across its range. And a new model that we identified in this study that generalizes OU motion by adding uh, periods of essentially straight line, ballistic-like motion at short time scales. We think that's related to foraging in the ungulate example that, we'll, that I'll show in a minute. So we call that the OUF process. Uh, and it introduces another time scale that's related to the transition between uh, how long you, you continue in the straight line motion and transition to Brownian motion at intermediate scales. Okay, so if you've seen uh, 
Thomas Mueller or Bill Fagan or Peter Leimgruber talk about uh, movement stuff before, you probably know the Mongolian gazelle example, now famous Mongolian gazelle example. Um, gazelles are known to be nomadic. They move huge distances in the eastern steppe grasslands of Mongolia. Um, and, man, this is really cutting off a lot of my slide. Um, okay, so this is uh, the particular study we're working with here is uh, 36 animals tra tracked with GPS Argos collars from 2007 to 2011. Um, and with some interesting details in the way the data were sampled. So different sampling rates for different individuals, mixes of sampling rates within the same individual, and all individuals featuring six-day bursts of sampling interspersed with 10-day gaps of nothing. So very challenging data to work with. Uh, standard uh, correlated random walk methods broke down completely on this data set. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think it's really worth okay. much more. I'll okay. just carry on. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. Yep. Now, now there it is. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Just like reboot it and then it will be fine. Um, okay, so now you are looking at um, uh, um, uh, variograms here and with the theoretical uh, semivariance functions for our four models fitted to them. So the variogram, the blue points, are the same in each panel. It's the semivariance plotted as a function of time lag. Okay, that's the average over all 36 gazelles in our sample. And the red curves are then the fitted models. So in the upper left we have Brownian motion. It's just a straight line on that kind of plot. Obviously not a very good descriptor of the data. Anomalous diffusion is similar. Also obviously not a very good descriptor of the data. OU motion is Brownian initially, sort of initially linear, and then it kind of asymptotes out to a constant uh, space uh, use area. And that fits a bit better, but only this uh, OUF model that incorporates, that's OU-like for larger lags, and it has this sort of uh, super diffusive or linear foraging-like behavior for uh, smaller lags fits um, the whole variogram well. Okay, and if you, you can do, you can fit these based on uh, like a weighted least squares regression, and then you can do like um, an AIC uh, model selection. And the difference between OUF and the next best model, which is OU, is greater than 700 AIC units. Now, it's not visually striking why that's the case, um, looking at it this way, but if you kind of zoom in to the, the small lag end of the variogram, so like way down in here, that's what this upper panel is. Um, you can see what's going on. So remember I said when, you, when, you're, calc when you're estimating the semivariance, you have more pairs of uh, points to average over at small lags, and you lose them as you go out in lag. So these points down here have really tight confidence intervals because you have the most data with which to estimate semivariance there. So you can see in the data there's this initial curvature. It's not linear like the OU model would suggest. That's in green here but it has this initial upward curvature that indicates that there's directional persistence in the movement over short time scales. The OUF model is capable of picking up that curvature and then also dealing with this flattening out, the slowing down and the expansion of space use as you go out and lag. Whereas the OU model just starts linear like Brownian motion and then eventually flattens out. Okay, so the parameters you're estimating when you're fitting these things, you can kind of almost read right off the variogram. Um, the uh, tau f, the foraging time scale, is related to the, the time it takes to transition from this initial linear behavior, ballistic-like behavior, to this intermediate scale Brownian behavior. That happens on a time scale of about six hours. And the home range time scale, related to how long it takes you to get across the home range, is about uh, on a scale of about 10 weeks. Okay, so those are biologically interpretable parameters that uh, characterize these models. You can also, from this asymptote, this um, home range variance, you can also calculate an estimate of the average home range size or say annual range size. We've had some internal debate about 
what specifically to call that because gazelles are nomadic. They don't have a home range in a traditional sense. But in any case, it's enormous. It's about the size of Portugal, 90-some uh, thousand kilometers squared for an individual. Okay. So with the gazelles from this approach, we learned that they have three distinct movement behaviors uh, that we can, we can see in, their da in the data. Small-scale superdiffusion, this is kind of straight-line behavior. Why do we think that's for related to foraging? Because when an ungulate grazes, it kind of puts its head down and walks in a straight line for a while. It does not do this. It does not go around like Brownian in motion. Um, at intermediate scales, over larger time scales and distances, they're kind of wandering around in the step over large distances. We think that's related to searching for areas of higher quality forage, higher quality grass. Grass quality is very patchy out there. Um, and then at the larger scale, they have this sort of mean reverting tendency that restricts them to a very, very large but well-defined area that's something like an annual range or a utilization distribution. Okay, more generally, beyond the gazelles, this kind of variogram analysis is very nice in the sense that it gives you a visual representation, a readily interpretable visual representation of the autocorrelation structure of your data. So you can compare models to it and make sure you're picking up all the important features in the data. The OUF model that Chris uh, worked out for this study only came to be because we saw that other existing models were not able to match all the features in the variogram that got us thinking as to what was missing, what's, what was, what's wrong. If you just did uh, the estimation without being able to sort of visualize how well the model actually describes the data, you wouldn't have had any idea uh, to do that. So that's a very important thing. Um, composite correlated random walks failed utterly on this data set because of the sampling structure of the data. It was far too ugly. But even if you simulate data from an OUF process uh, such that the data are perfect, no location error, no missing observations, no gaps, um, lots of data, lots of points, you still cannot recover the important time scales of the process that generated the data. You just can't see it with those approaches. You get something close to the sampling rate, which has nothing to do with the process, and you get something else that seems kind of random. Okay, so in the next talk, uh, Chris is gonna pick up on this and first talk a little bit about how you can get better estimates once you know what a good model for the data are using a full non-Markovian maximum likelihood. Uh, I should say non-Markovian, not non-maximum. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, Non-Markovian maximum likelihood analysis, and then he's going to link the characteristic scale of the movement uh, to those of the resources that might be driving the movement. So that's, that work is in, uh, in press now at Methods in Ecology. The stuff I've talked about in this talk is in the May issue of American Naturalist. Thank you. We've got time for just one very quick question. Um, yeah, there's, so to the, to the extent that your, um, your sampling is really fine, you're going to see something like that initial linear behavior pretty, in pretty much any example you look at. So we've looked at some other data sets and it does show up. If you sample really coarsely, you can't see it. You're, it's kind of below the resolution of your data. Um, in terms of the space use part, like the, the asymptote, um, sooner or later, you know, things can't keep expanding forever, so that something like that has to show up. You can also see other things, too. It's not necessarily just this. Like, for example, if you have migratory behavior, you can see that it kind of goes to an asymptote and then oscillates around it over time. But you need a long time series of data to see that. So there are other things you could pick, out of, pick out out of the variogram. If you have, like, a one-day uh, repeating behavior, then you might, if you have really good quality data, you might see an a really fine oscillation in the variogram, too.